Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on descriptive and inferential statistics. In counseling research, when we write manuscripts, we report the results of both descriptive and inferential statistics. And I'm going to describe them in general, but also give you some specific examples of both descriptive and inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics describe data and the measures of central tendency are common descriptive statistics that are reported. Inferential statistics infer characteristics of a population from a sample. So if you wanted to see how well a special teaching method worked in relation to a final exam, and this teaching method was for graduate students, your population would be all the graduate students in a program that was the same type as the one that you're teaching in. But accessing that entire population, meaning running a study that includes every graduate student, would be expensive and impractical. So instead we would draw a sample from that population. And inferential statistics allow us to test that sample and infer characteristics so we can make generalizations about the population from the data collected from a sample. Inferential statistics can be used to determine if a statistically significant difference exists between two or more groups, to determine what type of relationship exists between variables, and to predict group membership. So let's take a look at some of the descriptive statistics. You have the mean, which is of course the average, the median, which is the value in the middle of a set of values when they're ordered from lowest to highest, the mode, which is the value that appears the most times in a data set, the standard deviation, which is a measure of dispersion, variance is also a measure of dispersion, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, minimum and maximum values, the range, which would be the minimum value subtracted from the maximum value, percentages, and rank. Moving to inferential statistics, I have here some of the more common inferential statistics, and I'll describe these in more detail in a few moments. You have independent samples t-test, dependent samples t-test, which is also called a paired samples t-test, ANOVA, ANCOVA, MANOVA and MANCOVA, repeated measures ANOVA, chi-square, correlation, multiple regression, and discriminant analysis and logistic regression. So let's get started with t-test. So first we have independent samples t-test. An independent samples t-test is used when you have one independent variable with two levels and you have one dependent variable. So let's say that you want to use CBT to treat depression and you want to measure the level of depression using a depression inventory. So the independent variable, for example, could be treatment. And the two levels would be those that were treated with CBT and those that weren't, otherwise known as a treatment and control group and the measure that you use to determine the depression levels would be your one dependent variable. Now a dependent samples t-test is different. It uses matched pairs. So it's a within subjects design. So say that you had 30 participants and you administered a pretest to these participants and then there was a certain treatment that was administered and you administered a post-test which was identical to the pretest, so it would be the same dependent variable but it was administered two times. In that situation you would use a dependent samples t-test. Moving on to ANOVA. An ANOVA can handle one or more independent variables with multiple levels and one dependent variable. So expanding on the example for the independent samples t-test, if you had 
16 weeks of CBT as one level, 8 weeks as another level, and a control group as a third level, that would be three levels of one independent variable. And you used one dependent variable, you could use an ANOVA for that. You could also add an independent variable to that. So you have the CBT at two levels of duration and the control, and you could have another independent variable that could say have two levels, like group therapy and no group therapy. And again, still measuring on one dependent variable. So in that example, you would have a three by two ANOVA. Your first independent variable has three levels and your second independent variable has two levels. So ANCOVA is really the same thing as ANOVA except you add one or more covariates into the analysis. So expanding on my earlier example, let's say that you had one independent variable with two levels, CBT and a control group, and one dependent variable but the participants in your study all use alcohol and you're worried that the alcohol could be contributing to the depression so you want to control for that variable for the amount of use of alcohol it's called a covariate you want to partial that variable out and to do that you would use ANCOVA Now moving on to MANOVA. A MANOVA is the same as an ANOVA, except it has multiple dependent variables. So after a MANOVA is conducted, if there is a statistically significant result, you would follow up with several ANOVAs. And a MANCOVA is the same as a MANOVA, except you have one or more covariates. We can look now at some other popular statistics. First, we have repeated measures ANOVA. This is where you have multiple administrations of the same dependent variable or measure for the same participants. So an example where you would use repeated measures ANOVA would be, say you had a study that went on for a period of four years. And during these four years, you're going to test the same participants with the same instrument eight different times. In that situation you would use repeated measures ANOVA. A chi-square test answers the question, are observed frequencies statistically significantly different from expected frequencies? So let's say for a graduate program you have a lot of historical data about the number of students that are successful or unsuccessful in the program. So that's a categorical variable, in that case a dichotomous variable. It's either successful or unsuccessful. And then for a particular year, you look at the frequencies. You look at the number of successful students and the number of unsuccessful students. Those would be the observed frequencies. The chi-square would tell you if those observed frequencies are statistically significantly different from the expected frequencies that you already knew from your historical data. A correlation answers the question, how are two variables related? So let's use the example of GPA and a score on a final exam. The correlation will tell you the strength and the direction of that relationship. So let's say that you had a strong positive correlation between those two variables. That would, that would mean that as GPA went up, the final exam score would also go up. And because it's a strong positive relationship, you would expect significant movement on that final exam based on movement on that GPA. If it were a weak positive relationship, you would only expect some movement on the final exam as the GPA moved a lot. If you had a negative correlation, as the GPA went up, the final exam scores would go down. 
So this gives you information about how these variables are related or associated with one another, but correlation is not causality. That correlation between those two variables, for instance, would not tell you anything beyond strength and direction. It would not and could not speculate as to causality. Therefore, it wouldn't be suggesting that one of those variables causes the movement in the other, just that that movement exists, that association exists. Then we have multiple regression. Multiple regression answers the question, how much variance in the dependent variable is explained by independent variables? Another way this is worded for regression would be how much variance in the outcome variable is explained by the predictor variables. So using the example of, say, a comprehensive final exam, that would be your dependent variable. And let's say this comprehensive final exam is given at the end of a graduate program. And other predictor variables are collected early on in the graduate program. Let's say GPA, a pretest that is similar to the comprehensive uh, final exam, and an exam score from one particular course in the program. So what the multiple regression will do is indicate how much variance in the dependent variables explained by each of those independent variables, each of those predictor variables. Then we have discriminant analysis and logistic regression. These are two different statistics, but they answer the same question, which is what is the probability of group membership given specific values of independent variables? So going back to my earlier example of successful and unsuccessful students in a graduate program. So what if you use those same independent variables I mentioned in the multiple regression, like GPA, an exam in one of the earlier courses, and an exam similar to a comprehensive final exam. Both discriminant analysis and logistic regression would give you the probability that based on a set of those scores from those independent variables that a student would fall into one group versus the other, that a student would be successful or unsuccessful in the graduate program. So you may be wondering why we have two statistics that answer the same research question. But discriminant analysis and logistic regression each have advantages and disadvantages. For example, a discriminant analysis is more powerful, but it has many assumptions of the data. Logistic regression is not quite as powerful, but is less restrictive in terms of the assumptions of the data. I hope you found this video on descriptive and inferential statistics to be helpful. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to assist you.